going to be by Paul Bielowicz. He's the Vice President of the Rochester Baseball Historical Society. And um, he's going to be speaking to us about the um, baseball grounds of Rochester, New York. Uh, he's done extensive research into all professional fields that have been used in Rochester. And uh, he's um, definitely the leading expert on that. And has had uh, articles in the last several Red Wing programs, so you may uh, know some of his work from those. So, here is Paul B. Lewis. Good afternoon. Uh, so as Ryan said, my name is Paul Bielowitz, and this is a topic that I've done some extensive research on. Uh, where this all started, I've researched a number of different topics related to baseball in Rochester. Uh, I've done a little bit of research on the various uniforms that the teams have worn over the years. And I've, as Ryan said, I've worked with the team themselves on various historical projects, many of which have been published either on the team's website or in their yearbook. And that's actually how this project started about five years ago as we were preparing content for the Red Wings 2012 yearbook. I had pitched several ideas to the team and one of them that they were interested in in particular was the various baseball grounds and ballparks that have been used by the team over the years. So that's really when the research started and as I often do when I write yearbook articles for the team, I have a deadline that I'm working toward and I devote maybe a little bit of time in January and a little bit more time in February and as the deadline is looming in March, that's when I really kick it into high gear. And uh, so I, I did just enough research to put together a good, what I felt was a comprehensive list of the ballparks. I had an idea of where they were, but certainly not a whole picture. And so I, I really promised myself that I would work on continuing this research and that I really wanted to uncover those parts of the, the kind of mystery of where some of these older ballparks were and what they might have looked like. So what I have for you here is a retrospective and chronological order of all of the different ballparks that Rochester's professional teams have used and some of the supplemental ballparks, I'll talk a little bit about that. We've used more than one ballpark at the same time in certain cases. And just like uh, Tony started with and Rebecca covered as well, um, the research itself sometimes takes on a, a whole new life when, we, when we're trying to figure out the answer to certain questions, compelling questions that drive us in directions that we may never have anticipated when we started the research. So like Tony talked about, was this person related to that person? or when we talked about trying to uncover, uh, uh, trying to correct a historical fallacy. I ran into a lot of that in this research as well. So what I want to talk about, I'll quickly walk through the, uh, uh, excuse me, the ballparks themselves, and then I want to talk about a little bit of where I'm going with this research as well. So Rochester, New York, Baseball City, USA. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to walk around a little bit. I'll try to speak loud in case I get away from the microphone. Uh, but it, it helps if I can see you. I don't want to be hiding behind a podium. So in 1998, Baseball America named Rochester Baseball City USA. Rochester's been home to amateur baseball since 1825 and professional baseball since 1877. Before I go too much farther, though, I want to have a little bit of audience participation. I have one question. I want, I want you to guess how many different ballparks or professional baseball grounds have we had. Certainly we know about Frontier Field, and many of you I'm sure know about one or two before that. How many do you think there were in total? Does anyone have a guess? Seven, I hear. Any other guesses? I'd say at least a dozen. Not quite double digits. Frontier Field is the ninth ballpark to host Rochester's professional baseball teams. So here's an overview. I'll cover this slide again at the end, but this provides a little bit of a geographic overview. And as I mentioned, part of the story that I want to tell is the idea of when there were two ballparks at the same time. And that happened in two cases, where we have a clustering of baseball stadiums near the city, and then in two situations we had baseball parks on private property north by the lake. And I'll talk a little bit about that and why. And another thing that I'll be highlighting is you can see that some of these ballparks weren't used very long. Uh, the Windsor Beach baseball grounds were used just for a few years, Riverside Park just for a few years. And so as I did the research, that was part of the question that I was trying to answer as well. Why were there so many different ballparks? 
We think of Frontier Field, we're now in our 21st season there. Uh, Silver Stadium, previously known as Red Wing Stadium, we played 68 seasons there. Those are the benchmarks that we think of. Why were we only at some of these ballparks for a few years? That was a compelling question for me to try to answer as well. So I want to start with Mumford's Meadow. One of the earliest written accounts of baseball describes a team of men that played in a farmer's pasture in 1825. Tony touched on this briefly. This was, uh, I also did a, a research article on this for one of the Red Wings yearbooks a few years ago. Uh, and this is a quote from an autobiography of a gentleman who played with that team. A baseball club met every afternoon the ball ground containing some eight or ten acres known as Mumford's Meadow by the side of the river above the falls is now a compact part of the city. This was a whole research project in and of itself to try to determine where that was. But the reason I mention it here is because it provides a little bit of historical context uh, to, to show that we've been playing baseball here in Rochester for almost 200 years, well before the mythical invention of the game by Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown uh, 14 years later. Amateur baseball in Rochester in the mid-1800s. Before the advent of professional baseball in Rochester, amateurs played at many locations, including Brown Square, Jones Square, Franklin Square, and Babbitt Track. And I've highlighted just a few here. And one of the things that I find particularly interesting is this, the current site of Frontier Field, is only one block from Brown Square, where is one of the sites where amateur baseball was played. And in fact, if you go just a little bit farther to the High Falls area over here, that's where Mumford's Meadow is. And Tony mentioned the Live Oak Polka here, and this is actually Jones Square that's depicted on the cover of the Live Oak Polka. So let me get into quickly Rochester's first permanent ballpark. In 1877, with the formation of Rochester's first professional team, the first permanent ballpark was erected on North Union Street, not far from the current site of the Rochester Public Market. This is one of those situations where I had a basic idea of where the ballpark was, but, but no real information. One of the contemporary accounts at the time, or one of the written accounts that I was able to find, said that the ballpark was at Sio Street, or, yeah, was at Sio Street and Well, which was houses and a few other things. So I knew I had a basic idea. And then just as Priscilla was able to help Tony, Priscilla helped me as well by opening my eyes to a lithograph. This is an 1880 illustration that shows a huge portion of the city of Rochester, but one tiny little part of it shows what was then called Hop Bitters Baseball Ground. And if any of you have been to the Genesee Brew House and to the museum that's on the first floor of the Brew House, there's a gigantic print about the size of this screen of that 1880 lithograph. And if you look very close, you can actually see this tiny little portion that depicts this baseball ground. So while it's not perfectly to scale, there are a couple of streets labeled. We have Tappan Street, we have uh, Sio Street, so you can get a basic idea. And if you compare it to period maps, what I was able to determine is that it's more or less in this uh, squarish, rectangular area here. And I've covered it over with some arrows and uh, markings here, but this property owner is Mary Aikenhead. And one of the contemporary newspaper accounts that I found referred to the, the tract of land where the ballpark was as the Aikenhead plot. So I'm pretty confident that that is, in fact, where it was, as I mentioned, not too far from the Rochester Public Market. And this is the only illustration that I've been able to, as I knock my water down, the only illustration that I've been able to find of it. So certainly more research required, but I do have a basic idea. Continuing along, in 1886, the next ballpark was Culver Park Grounds, which was located on University Avenue at the current location of the Gleason Works. It was opened in 1886 and used until 1892. So I mentioned a little bit of confusion when I was researching the Hot Bitters or the Union Street baseball grounds in terms of the street names. And this is another area where it was a little bit difficult. So this is a 1900 plat map that we're looking at here. Or excuse me, a little bit older. I think this is an 1888 plat map here. And the street names are different. What we now know as University Avenue was actually called Culver Park at the time. And what we now know as Atlantic Avenue was known as University at the time. So when the ballparks were described, 
this one and one at a similar location later on were described as being at University in Culver. When we think of that intersection today, that's actually a little bit farther east. It's a whole different intersection. It's where the price right is now, for example, whereas this was actually a little bit farther west toward where the intersection of Atlantic and University are today. And I was able to find that on the map. So this ballpark was primarily square in shape with the basic, the main grandstand behind home plate at the south end of the ballpark. Uh, I was able to find a depiction of that in the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle in May of 1886, right before it opened. Um, but as was the case in a few of these ballparks, we had, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, there were several different reasons why these ballparks stopped being used. One of them was due to tragedy. In this one, a fire destroyed the primary grandstand in October of 1893. Now we were lucky here in that no, no baseball was being played at the time. The ballpark was out of use at that point. It was still sitting there and had been used by amateur teams earlier that season. But that fire spelled the ultimate demise. And as we were talking in the first two presentations about how uh, incorrect information can be uh, carried on through the years in, in a middle initial or in an incorrect account of when or why something happened. A lot of the research that I had done had this fire happening in 1892, uh, but as I scoured newspapers from 1892, I couldn't find a word about a fire. So I kept looking and looking and looking until I found that this fire was actually in 1893. So if you look in some of the historical records and research books that talk about Rochester's ballparks, many of them have that as being 1892, which to my knowledge is incorrect. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the supplemental baseball grounds. Rochester had what was called blue laws on the books, which prohibited the playing of baseball games within city limits on public property on Sundays. And so the enterprising owners of the teams at the time found creative ways around that. General Henry Brinker, who was owner of the ball club, president of the ball club, was also owner of the RW and O, Rome, Watertown, and Ogdensburg Railroad line. And that railroad line ran all the way north to the lake. And what you're looking at here is the east side of the Genesee River uh, at the current site of what we know as Somerville. And so he, together with some of his partners from the railroad, put together a promotion to have Sunday baseball games at this new baseball grounds on the property of the railroad in this area up north by the lake. And so they advertised it heavily and they offered promotions where for one price you get your train ticket, the train drops you off no more than 20 feet from the, from the entrance to the ballpark, and you can spend your whole Sunday afternoon there having a leisurely day at the lake and then take the train back when you're finished. So that actually worked out quite well for about five years, 1888 through 1892 or so, four or five years, while this ballpark was in use. This ballpark, like the other uh, supplemental ballpark, has been, which I'll talk about in a minute, has also been a little bit enigmatic. I had a basic idea of where it was, um, but I, I really didn't have much information that said specifically where it was other than Somerville. And I have an overlay here uh, that shows a Google image. If you look at the current Google image, there's certainly nothing that gives a clue of where a ballpark might have been. And even the period maps at the time show the railroad lines, but don't show anything about uh, baseball grounds. And certainly nothing that would have had this complex arrangement of grandstands and bleachers. And again, thank Priscilla for that. She brought that illustration to my attention. Thank you. So what I was able to find that actually helped supplement my information and helped me come closer to confirming where I believe this ballpark actually was is there's a website called historicaerials.com where you can look at historic aerial photography and the images are heavily watermarked. You have to pay for them if you want their use to their rights, uh, rights of their use, excuse me. But what I was able to find was an aerial photograph from the early 1950s. Now this ballpark was used in the late 1800s and certainly would not still have existed. But what I was able to find was a clearing in the woods, which was roughly circular. And if you use your imagination and look very closely, I was able to find a shape that looked like it could have been the remnants of a baseball diamond. So I've shown uh, where that was in relation to the current Google street layout as well as the 1902 map. So that's actually my best guess right now as to where that baseball grounds was. 
Next, we go to Riverside Park. So Rochester had no professional team in 1893 or 1894, but rejoined the Eastern League for the 1895 season. And the three co-owners, rather than building, uh, excuse me, rather than rebuilding the burned Culver Park grounds, chose to build a new ballpark. Now you notice one definite characteristic of this design, which is this large circle. So when I found this depiction, this illustration, that piqued my interest. So what that was, was a bicycle track. Catering to the bicycle craze that swept Rochester in the late 1800s, the ballpark was designed to include a bicycle track as well as a baseball diamond. So this track was actually a concrete bicycle track that was a quarter mile in circumference and 20 feet wide. So the ballpark itself, the baseball diamond, was built inside that track, and then there were three grandstands around the bicycle track. The location was just opposite the current site of Seneca Park and Seneca Park Zoo. So again, I had an, an idea where I thought this was, but we were able to find, uh, with a little bit more information, we were able to find a property map that had a little bit of a cryptic description of Roch BB Co, seven acres. And, and it's a little small, but if you look right there, you can see right where that is. So that's actually my best guess, Rochester Baseball Company, that that's where that was. And if you compare that with a current satellite image, uh, it's right between, it's, it's just on the east side of St. Paul, uh, right between, let me get the names of the streets right, Barry Road and Paxton Road, if you're familiar with the area at all. So that was interesting too, to be able to locate exactly where that was. Now, one of the things that I'm sometimes asked when I give this presentation, and I've often wondered myself, is do you think that the people who live there now have any idea that there was a ballpark in their backyard? And my guess is probably not, because this research is not something that's really out there, that, that not a lot of people know about. And certainly, to have a quarter mile concrete track I often wonder if they're putting in a garage or digging a new extension to their basement, do they ever come across chunks of concrete in their backyard? And I'm guessing they must. It's really interesting to think about you know, what became of all of these old ballparks. I mean, the wooden parts of the grandstand would have rotted or been taken down over the years, but something more permanent like concrete, I would think there's gotta be remnants still there. Oh, let me touch on one more thing before I move along. Sunday Blue Laws continued to be a problem, and actually, uh, although this ballpark was in, uh, not in the city of Rochester, it was actually in the town of Irondequoit at the time, the town of Irondequoit also had similar Blue Laws on the books which prevented uh, baseball on Sundays. And so this actually culminated in 1897 in what became known as the Kid Gannon case, where six ballplayers were arrested for playing baseball on Sunday. So the big three, the owners at the time, didn't want to deal with that hassle anymore and actually picked up the team, uprooted them right mid-season, and moved the team to Montreal in July of that season. So we had no baseball in Rochester for the remainder of the 1897 season. But we fielded a new club for the 1898 season and with new ownership built a new ballpark, Culver Field. This is at the same location of the former Culver Park grounds that burned. Uh, at Jersey Street and what is now called University. So if you look at this plat map, which is from 1900, the street names are now what we know them as, University and Atlantic. So again, this right here was kind of right near where they come together. And actually, this, is, uh, this street is still here. This is where Nosh Restaurant is, if anyone knows where that is. And it's at the site of the current Gleason Works as well. Uh, so, like Riverside Park, this one also had a bicycle track, but this bicycle track was not concrete, this was wooden, and I imagine that it must have looked something like a deck. It was described as being elevated, and it was actually pitched, and I haven't been able to find anything that describes the angle of the pitch, but I imagine that it was something like what we would think of as a NASCAR track. And it was actually described in the contemporary newspaper accounts that in the farthest reaches of the outfield, people would sit on this bicycle track as if it was a supplemental grandstand or bleacher. But it was pitched at such an angle that people tried to sit on it and often slid down toward the field. So it's really interesting for me to try to imagine what that must, must have been like. And when I try to visualize what these old ballparks look like, and there's definitely a scarcity of photos, I've started to do something which I'll talk about in just a minute to bring these ballparks to life and that's what for the last couple minutes of my presentation what I'll be talking about. 
this was another of our supplemental ballparks. A few years after we stopped using Windsor Beach, we started using a ballpark on the west bank of the Genesee River called Ontario Beach Ballpark. Uh, this ballpark, the claim to fame is that it hosted at least one major league game between Cleveland and Brooklyn in 1898. This is one of the more recent ones that I found out about, so I don't have a lot of research on this. I have one period map from, I think this map is 1892, or excuse me, 1902 that shows it here, and then one photo that shows it just kind of from the backside here. But you can see the, the shape of the grandstand pretty much corresponds to the shape depicted on the map. So more research is needed on that one. Now we're getting into a little bit more of the modern era, and this is what might start to look a little bit more familiar to some of us. Baseball Park at Bay Street. This one, there's several photos because this is the time of Albert Stone, who was a photographer the, for the Rochester Herald newspaper. So if you look at the online collections of photos that are here uh, as part of the collection of the library of the Rochester Museum and Science Center, there's a lot of stone photos that show this ballpark. Open for the 1908 season, it was the host of Rochester baseball for 21 seasons through 1928. Uh, a lot of the pictures that exist show the fans and even cars packing the recesses of the outfield. It was a huge ballpark, a huge grounds. You can see how it looks on the map here. So this long, long center field and right field area was too long for most ball players to hit the ball out of except there is folklore and a legend, I don't know if it's true, that Babe Ruth is one of the only players to hit a ball over the right field fence during a barnstorming appearance in 1921. So again, take that with a grain of salt. I don't know if that's entirely true, but there you go. Uh, and there's another interesting photo here, uh, which shows uh, looking from second base, a panoramic image of the outfield wall with a lot of the graphics and billboards that were there at the time. In 1928, the St. Louis Cardinals purchased the baseball team and renamed them the Rochester Red Wings. And so that was the last year played at Baseball Park at Bay Street because they then announced grand plans for a big new ballpark, which we now know as Silver Stadium. So 1929 to 1996, originally opened as Red Wings Stadium, renamed Silver Stadium in honor of Maury Silver in 1968. Built by the parent Cardinals at a cost of 415000 Nicknamed by a rival player during the opening game in May of 1929 as the Taj Mahal of the minor leagues. It reminded many players of the major league stadiums of the era. Fans were in awe when they first came through those gates on May 3rd, 1929. And so I mentioned that I've done several articles for the Rochester Red Wings yearbooks. This is uh, what my article was this year. What did this ballpark look like when it first opened in 1929? So I'll cover that in just a minute. Uh, several used over the course of 68 seasons, several changes over the years, uh, one of which was the outfield wall. So the original outfield wall was this whole shape here where the left center field, the left field fence met the center field fence at a right angle. In 1933, lights were added and the first night game was played there on August 7, 1933. One of the light posts, as you can see, was put in right in what used to be left field. So they built a new wall around it, bringing that wall in a little bit. So you can see that right there, 1933. And then in 1946, the wall was changed again to bring that angle to a straight line, meeting up with the center field wall of the scoreboard. And this here, the 1946 wall, is the configuration that most of us would have seen as it went through its final years all the way to 1996. So that last configuration actually stayed that way for 50 seasons. It was originally a chain link fence and there was bullpens behind there and then it was built into a solid wall with billboards that most of us would have known. Frontier Field, 1997 to present. This is the ballpark certainly that all of us know, but I'll touch on a few interesting details. Uh, last year I did some research on what used to be there before Frontier Field was there. So I do have one aerial photo from 1993 that ran in the newspaper when it was a proposed site. Directly before the ballpark, it was land that was owned by Kodak, uh, but long before that, it was a very, uh, a very crowded industrial area with trains and other buildings going through there. I have a depiction of that, too. Uh, a couple other interesting design elements of this ballpark and some of the early versions of the design. Uh, there was actually another building that was meant to be incorporated into the ballpark. So we all know that the firehouse, at, which is at the corner of Maury Silver Way and Plymouth, uh, was able to be incorporated into the extents of the ballpark, but there was actually another building that was intended to be included as well, 
which is shown right here, which is called the Genesee Refrigeration Building. That's an old building. It was more than 100 years old at the time, but in 1995, there was a fire which rendered it structurally unsound, and it had to be demolished before the ballpark was finished. Another interesting aspect of the original design of the ballpark is where we now know the picnic area to be, the picnic pavilion. There was sand volleyball courts planned at one point. So I don't know if that ever got past the design stages, if that was ever seriously planned, but this image here from 1994 shows it, so I thought that was interesting to point out. So again, back to the overview. So this is the nine ballparks that were used. Now I'm running out of time, so I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but I mentioned several times that especially these older ballparks, that certainly uh, there aren't any photos, and there's very little in the way of historical accounts of what the ballparks actually looked like. Uh, very little that would say the grandstand was 38 feet tall by 43 feet wide and it was in a U shape and it was built of wood. There's nothing like that. So I've had to do a lot of kind of interpretation of historical context and what ballparks would have looked like at the time. Uh, I've used what photos that I've been able to find, but I've always been trying to think about what would be a better way to visually depict these old ballparks. So I've recently become familiar with 3D modeling software, and for my latest research project, I took it upon myself to build a 3D software model of Red Wing Stadium, of what it would have looked like when it opened in 1929. And so that's what this is. So that's if you go to Red Wings opening day or go to any game this year and open up the yearbook, you'll see this in an article. So I've used SketchUp, which is a free 3D software modeling program to painstakingly recreate what Red Wing Stadium would have looked like when it first opened. I won't go into a lot of detail because this is in the article, but I wanted to point out a few of the advantages of this type of software rendering. Uh, certainly you can use it to depict things that you were never able to visualize before. Uh, so while there are a lot of photos of Silver Red Wing Stadium, uh, as I mentioned, there's very few photos of some of the earlier ballparks, so it's definitely in my longer term plans to depict as many as possible of these nine ballparks in such a way. Uh, you're able to see what the ballpark would have looked like from any different angle. You're able to spin it around, rotate it, fly over it, walk through it, uh, see what the surrounding areas would have looked like. So using the plat maps and other period information, I was able to kind of build a model of what the whole little neighborhood over there on Clinton Avenue would have looked like. I had to include that because that showed in the extents of the image that I created. What did the entrance way, the, the entry plaza ticket office look like when it first opened? We only remember this probably as the team offices, but that was actually where the fans came in at the time before any of those other buildings were built. So this has been a really interesting project to do, and I'm quite interested in continuing. You may have seen this in last year's yearbook. I touched on this a minute ago. What was at the site of Frontier Field before Frontier Field was there? Again, it was a vibrant neighborhood, and I was able to use this 3D software modeling, 3D modeling software to depict what that area would have looked like. There was a large uh, train freight house there. There was residential areas. There was a school here. There was the Alling and Corey building. That's one of the few remaining buildings that was left when the ballpark was built that was demolished. And then you can see small number three there, that Genesee refrigeration building that existed until 1995 when it burned and was originally intended to be included in the ballpark. So there's another application. Uh, I've started to do Union Street Ball Grounds, the original one that I showed at the very beginning. This model here is old. I did that maybe four years ago just to try to see what it would have looked like. I started to do Bay Street Park as I was learning the software, so certainly have a lot more work to do, but this is really, when I'm finished, is going to bring these old ballparks to life in much a similar way as to what I've been able to do more recently as I've gotten better at the software and learned it a little bit more. So certainly more to come. Maybe my next presentation will be to show you the full 3D view of one of these ballparks and, and fly through it as if you were there. So that's the end for me. The last thing I'll mention is this actual presentation and more information is available on our website, rochesterbaseballhistory.org. If you click on research projects and go down to ballparks and early baseball grounds, uh, there's two links there. The first one is a PDF of this, and there's also a Word document where I describe each of these in a little bit more detail. So that's it for me. Um, what questions can I answer?
become so cookie cutter. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, when that started to happen and why? So, yeah, great question. So if anyone didn't hear, the, the question was, in the old days, the ballparks had a lot of unique character to them, and, and more recent ballparks have become more cookie cutter. When did that start to happen? I think when you think of the phrase cookie cutter ballparks, it, it generally tends to bring images of uh, Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium, Bush Stadium in St. Louis, these uh, Shea Stadium, these kind of circular stadiums that were designed to be multi-purpose ballparks. Um, so I think to an extent that the, the era of cookie cutter ballparks really began in maybe the mid, uh, mid 20th century and, and late 60s, early 70s in particular. Um, in terms of field configurations, the, the field itself went through lots of changes. And as I do in more detail in that 3D rendering of Union Street, uh, the Union Street grounds, the field itself was actually quite different. The diamond had different dimensions. The pitcher was closer. Uh, the pit, there was no pitcher's mound back in those days. Um, so incorporating that into the uh, renderings of these ballparks themselves has been important to me because I want them to be historically accurate. But uh, you mentioned Red Wing Stadium when it first opened. Yeah, I found it quite interesting that the outfield was at its longest point, 458 feet. And a lot of times um, that was based on the characteristics of the neighborhood that you would squeeze a ballpark into whatever space you had. In, in the Union Street grounds, uh, it was squeezed into what was already a residential neighborhood. So that, in a way, influenced the design characteristics of the ballpark. In the case of Red Wing Stadium, uh, that was just a huge open field that had been used as a circus field prior to the ballpark. So there was no real physical constraints as to why they built the ballpark that way. Uh, one of the other things that I'll mention, though, is that the design firm who designed Red Wing Stadium had done several other stadiums that were similar, one of which was what was called Buffalo Stadium in Houston. So it was called Buffalo because the name of the team was the Houston Buffaloes. So if you look up Buffalo Stadium in Houston, uh, it looks a lot like what Red Wing Stadium looked like when it opened. And then there was a couple others as well, one in Columbus, which was also one of the farm clubs of St. Louis, and I think one in Indianapolis as well, that were all very similar. They were all designed by the same firm. Good question. Any other questions? I know we're a little bit over on time, so I apologize. Okay, I'll, I'll be available if anyone else wants to ask questions after the show.